When Vlaine and I arrived in the field, the castle across from us, we were greeted by a large crowd of people. They were standing around Hargel and Lith. Many of them were arguing. Most of them were players who had joined our side, though there were a few monsters intermixed as well. After they parted to let me into the little circle, it became apparent what they all wanted. Lith stood silently, as if afraid that if he spoke he would end up giving in. Hargel, however, was trying his best to explain that if we accepted all of them into House Cerberus, then the next battle would have no meaning. His words were being drowned out by the shouting of people who wanted to help us fight against Ulsic and whoever he managed to bring with him. Finally, the monster leader stepped into the circle as well, and everyone became silent, staring at him. He had closed his eyes and was revolving where he stood, very, very slowly, as if attempting to hear the sounds of everyone around him. The silence continued as people seemed to be trying to figure out what he was trying to hear. Slowly, he opened his eyes and began to speak. He was proud of the monsters. He had always been. And after seeing how hard everyone had fought in the last battle, he felt that he would regret not telling them everything that he was about to say. Ulsic had become a symbol to him. A symbol of everything he didn't want LARP players to be. He was a disease. A cancer that continued to afflict the LARP as long as he remained. Many of the crowd nodded in agreement, none daring to say anything, a strange tension pervading the entire field. The old man paused, as if questioning whether this was enough to justify what could be considered a petty hatred, but he continued on. Ulsic needed to be defeated by the things he didn't understand. The man didn't know anything other than how to bully people with powers that wasn't his, and how to gather people who were willing to follow him in exchange for some of that power. He was barely a human, and more of an agent of corruption and decay, and his character now reflected on that side of him. Ulsic the Lich needed to be defeated by people he had overlooked. People who had not been intimidated by his power. People who succeeded with nothing other than their own skills and talents. He deserved to be killed by people he hated the most. The people he was jealous of. The people who reminded him of how miserable of a person he was. It was people that were not seduced by his promises of power. He didn't rely on character sheets to fight for them. He would enter a fight even with losing odds. These were the people who would defeat Ulsic. I had been listening intently, but a sight drew away most of my attention. Hargel looked sick. As the monster leader continued to speak, Hargel stopped being able to look at him. He gazed around and caught my eye, and I saw a guilty expression that I quickly understood. Hargel, when the LARP had first started, had followed Ulsic, acting on his orders no matter what they were, just so that he could gain power. He had even managed to become a member of Ulsic's noble house with his efforts, and in the first event I had gone to, he had chosen to spend his time with Ulsic rather than with his friends. Hargel had a lot in common with Ulsic. Both were mages, both were among the strongest characters in the game, and both revered the contempt of nobility. Had I not presented Hargel with the opportunity to kill Ulsic at my last event, he might still be serving under him, seeking to rise in position and power. Though the monster leader's speech was rather good, I chose to interrupt it, saying that none of what he had just said mattered. The monster leader stopped, but he smiled at me waiting for me to continue. I said that my reasons for hating Ulsic were not that he represented all the evil in the world, but because he was an awful man who had tried to ruin my friend's fun-filled fantasy adventures. The crowd around us seemed taken aback, but I continued, saying that what Lith had said was true, that this was a private feud between houses. Though plenty of people would wish for it, Ulsic's death only had meaning to us. The crowd began to shout, at first all at once and then in turn, one person shouted that Ulsic had destroyed his small noble house several months ago, and that he had just as much of a right to fight him. Another person shouted that Ulsic had scared his girlfriend so badly that she no longer wanted to come to the LARP. Another shouted that Ulsic had borrowed ten gold and never paid it back. <laughs> what a skeevy bastard! <laughs> Denying borrowing it in the first place. Ulsic's crimes and sins were everywhere. Everyone had one or two to share, and while I could have guessed, I would never have known that Ulsic really was such an absolute villain. After some time, the monster leader spoke again, quickly quieting the crowd. He said that there was no way that we could all kill Ulsic, though we all deserved to be the one who killed him. He pitiably only had one life to offer. House Cerberus would shoulder everyone's desire to give Ulsic what he deserved. Each member had now heard Ulsic's crimes, and would seek vengeance for them. He looked at me and fell silent, and I realised what he wanted me to say. I apologised. I said that I had spoken without thinking, without knowing everyone else's reason, but now I knew, and I, along with the rest of House Cerberus, 
would make certain that we would deliver to Ulsic every share of vengeance that was due to him. We would punish him where it hurt the most, by tearing apart his pride with the fewest amount of people. How Cerberus, I pledged, would not betray them. The crowd seemed somewhat pacified, though not exactly happy. Thankfully, the monster leader began speaking to them again, and I saw that Harja was looking a little better. I walked over to him, and he smiled. He and I started to walk towards the castle, and Lith and Selina soon joined us. I wondered if the four of us could defeat Ulsic, but I at least knew there was a chance, one that I was willing to gamble everything. An odd shuffling noise came from behind us. I almost groaned when I realised what it must be, but I held it in, turning around. I was surprised to see not only one girl dressed in black, but five. I launched into an argument, saying that we had just turned down the aid of several of the most skilled and most powerful people at this LARP, and it would be insane to think that we would take them with us. This was a matter for House Cerberus, and they would more than likely be a detriment to us than an asset. After saying all that, and seeing that none of them seemed at all repulsed or inclined to leave, I finally said that I didn't want them to die over something so stupid on their very first event. The shuffling girl made her way to the front of her friends, looking defiantly at me. She said that they were just as much as part of House Cerberus as any of us were. Since they had been made squires this very morning, I almost wanted to argue that they hadn't even been members for an entire day. But remembering that I was only inducted into the house some minutes before they were, kept me quiet long enough for her to continue. She said that all the stuff that we had told to other people was about how we were supposed to be breaking Ulsic's pride. And she then asked if there was anything more humiliating than being beaten by a gang of teenage girls. Her friends looked at her as if she had just insulted them, but she kept staring directly at me, impressed slightly. I couldn't find the right words to tell them that I still didn't want them to join us and they took my silence as agreement, and ended up walking with us to the castle. Before we reached it, the old man hobbled towards us, perhaps intent on creating a reunion of the first night. When he got near, my resolve in telling him to stay out of this was wavered when I saw the hope-filled look in his eyes. His grandson wasn't too far behind, and I wondered if everyone was about to come and ask to join us. Thankfully, the old man only wanted to say that he knew that we were going to win, and that he wanted to wish us the best of luck anyway. He admitted he didn't really understand everything, but he knew enough to say that I was a good guy, and that the Ulsic person was a downright villain. His grandson merely nodded in my direction, before moving over to Lith, who he began to talk to with enthusiasm. Before I could move over to them to hear what they were talking about, the shuffling girl started to ask me about what my battle plans were. It wasn't very long into my explanation that she decided to change the subject, asking me whether I appreciated her. It was such an odd phrase that I had to consider what she was asking, and the proper moment to reply passed before I had an answer. Realising that it looked as if I was contemplating the question far more deeply than I was, I quickly replied that I don't know what I was feeling at the moment, with the boldness that initially surprised me, but now I had started to expect from her. She said that I was always overthinking things. I knew this only too well, but she added that I really should just know what I'm feeling without having to think about it. Girls like guys who are in touch with their emotions, she hinted, and I wondered whether this was time for this conversation, telling her that I wasn't the kind of guy who cries during sad movies. I turned towards Lith and the grandson, who had finished talking. As the grandson walked away, I asked Lith what they had discussed, but Lith only managed to say that they had discussed shield techniques before people began to start shouting behind us. I turned around quickly to see Ulsic and who he had brought with him. He was walking towards us with arrogance deep in each of his steps. He didn't look at all as if any of what had happened before had affected him at all. As if the rest of the players sending him off to die was something insignificant. It wasn't until this very moment that I knew that this final stage was more important than any other. To his right were three people. The fat woman warrior was there, her allegiance to Ulsic unquestioned. Next to her was Selina's ex-boyfriend, the man I had killed twice before and now wanted to kill so dearly for the third time. And to his right was a teenager, who I could only guess was an idiot, who had decided to pledge unwavering loyalty to Ulsic on his very first event. To his left were, to my surprise, only four others, Rubido and Promeus, along with the Black Scaled and the Grey Armoured Warriors, Tiburon, Corpus, and the plate-wearing Hammer Wielder were not there and my opinion of those three skyrocketed, even if the reason they weren't there was because they had died. Ulsic stopped a good distance away, and his entourage stopped a little behind him. The crowd within the field moved towards the edges, encircling Ulsic's grip as well as ours. 
as if staking out their arena in which we would battle. The tension rose rapidly, as everyone simply silent watched and waited, taking in both sides and trying to determine by sight alone which one would win. The eight of them stood across the field from the nine of us. Hargill stood in the centre, with Lith on his right, me on his left. Selina stood next to me, a quiet rage inside of her as she stared at her ex-boyfriend. He stared at her with equal intensity. The rest of the girls looked nervous, as if for the first time realising they'd actually be fighting. Also began what sounded like a start of a speech, but Harjo called out over him to shut up and fight. Also paused, but then tried to continue. But Lith told him once again that no one wanted to hear what he had to say. Ulsic, looking furious, said something to his companions and they started to run towards us. The people he had imported from the medieval combat recreation society were far faster than their allies and all of them were heading in my direction. They looked as if they were racing to reach me first and I did what any smart man would do. I shouted for everyone to head into the castle and ran. Fighting them in an open battle would be insane, since those four warriors were more than enough to defeat us. We needed to go into a place where they could try and defeat them in detail. Once inside, I realised I needed to make a slight deviation from my original plan. Originally, I had planned on Hargill, Lith, Selina and I being the only ones, enabling us to manoeuvre fairly quickly inside the castle. With the addition of the five teenage girls who were actually starting to panic, we wouldn't be able to move anywhere as quickly as we needed to. Once inside the castle, my memory attempted to combine with what I was seeing, a map of the layout reforming in my mind. The core of the building was a sturdy, enclosed structure that even had a second level, while the rest was an open roofed semi-labyrinth made of standing plywood. It was thankfully brighter than it had been when I had last visited, and everything was just as I remembered. The spectators outside the castle would be unable to see what was going on inside, but they would certainly be able to hear it. I would have preferred if everyone could watch Ulsa get defeated, but actually defeating him took priority. With walls obstructing everyone's vision, we could hope to separate and defeat Ulsa's grip. Only 30 seconds within the castle, I realised our own grip would have to split up. It happened without any planning. Just a moment passed and I realised that Lith and the five Goths had separated from us. Hoping that he had some sort of plan, I continued on with Hargill and Selina. Deep inside the labyrinth, Selina stopped asking if I had been hurt at all. After healing me the 10 points of damage I had taken earlier, she asked what we should do about our plan. It was quickly unravelling, as it became clear that while we had counted on Ulsic's group being unable to remain together, we hadn't realised the difficulty of keeping together ourselves. Deciding quickly, I said that she and Harjo would stay together, while I sought out our enemies. These two staying alive was vital, since they were needed to destroy the phylactery and I could manoeuvre through the rooms and corridors more easily by myself. Hargill nodded his agreement to this plan, but Selina looked hesitant. She looked as if she was about to say something, but there was no time for me to waste. I ran off, hoping that they would try and stay safe. The construction didn't seem to follow any set standard, with some corridors wider than the others and odd openings and exits placed almost as if by random chance. Hearing footsteps in the corridor next to mine, I followed next to them until an opening revealed Rubido, who was only too glad to see me. His short sword flashed out, forcing me to block with my hand. I leapt back into the corridor as he entered mine, grinning a fair bit. Without hesitating, I threw an ice spell at him, hoping to force him to dodge back. As it hit him, he smiled, then stepped forward, amused by my shocked expression. He was temporarily immune to ice spells, he told me, and as I cursed Ulsic, we began to fight in earnest. I was at the disadvantage. My sword was too long for fighting indoors, something I thought I would be able to learn how to deal with. In comparison, Rubido's short sword was ideal, and he remained on the offensive, the red cape that covered his right side fluttering as he struck. My left arm was doing the majority of the blocking, and it didn't take me long to figure out that he wasn't holding back at all. Inside these walls, far away from observing eyes, rules no longer existed, unless we wanted them to. As my left arm began to shudder slightly from the pain of each of Rubido's blows, I began to wonder if he was actually targeting my arm. I brought it out to the side and was surprised to see him ignore the chance for hitting my chest, instead aiming for my left forearm once again. Realising that what I had thought had been blocking was nothing more than presenting with the target he wanted. He was smiling at my pain, striking as hard as he could, knowing that if my left arm was finally flattered, I would be only too easy to kill. He wanted to defeat me as cruelly as he could, 
and he was doing a very good job at it. I knew he had a reason to be angry. I had killed him in the cheapest way I could have and then robbed him of all of his important items. My half-hearted attempts at saving his life meant nothing and I should have expected this wrath and perhaps I even deserved it. But now was not the time for me to atone nor was it the time for me to be defeated by an overconfident sadist who had given his worst enemy plenty of time to think. I thrust forward my sword, intentionally missing his body. He ignored the strike, thinking it was just a wild one caused by my desperation and the difficulty of the situation. But I had managed to strike my target. With a flourish, I whipped the edge of his cape upwards, allowing it to fall over his face. Blind, he struggled with his left hand to get it out of his face, but the one opening was all I needed. My sword sank again and again into his left side. The eight damage I dealt multiplying with each hit, he managed to get his cape away from his head in time for me to deal the final blow to his shoulder, forcing him to drop to his knee. Not willing to take the chance that one of his allies would find him and revive him, I placed the tip of my sword at his heart, counted the three seconds and dealt him a killing blow. He looked up at me, anger and rage trembling inside him, but I didn't have the time to watch him break down. Running off, I needed to find Lith and the girls to make sure they were okay. I tried listening to them and was certain I could hear them in the distance. Trying to navigate my way through the confusing passages, I turned a corner and was not at all happy to see what I found. The grey armoured warrior stood across a long corridor from me, standing with his axe held out in front of him. He called out to me, introducing himself as regent. I responded in kind and he seemed rather pleased by this. Without saying anything else, he ran forward. I whipped my sword out at him, but he blocked with his axe, holding it towards me like a shield. With a quick twist, he swung at me, forcing me backward. He was excellent. Only my quick understanding of this saved me. After a brief exchange where he landed two blows for seven damage each, I knew that I was outclassed. I kept moving backwards, not even attempting to engage him, only swinging my swords in hopes that I would keep him from simply charging straight into me. He would block with his axe easily and try to return a blow almost in the same instant, and only the reach of my weapon and my constant retreat kept him from landing ahead. Frowning, he didn't approve of my tactic, but it wasn't long before I had run out of room. With all my hopes and dreams, I whipped a beanbag at him, hoping to halt his advance. It barely struck his arm, and he stood frozen, waiting to see what my next action was. I knew I couldn't face him in the restrictions of these corridors, and probably outside of them as well. I turned to run away, but hear him say words that made me turn around instantly. He had cast an ice spell, the same one I had used on him, and it hit me in the chest, pinning my legs to the ground. Not even allowing myself to be surprised, I quickly pulled out another beanbag, ready to throw at him. He also brandished one, and we both seemed to contemplate the situation. My fire spells would kill him in time, but right now I didn't have that luxury. There were shouts coming from all around us, and I momentarily considered shouting for help. I dismissed this, since I knew full well that it was just as likely that an enemy would come rather than an ally. Though the two of us could throw ice spells at each other all day, we would be simply preventing each other from taking part in the rest of the battle, something neither of us could afford to do. I waited, the seconds slowly passing, and it looked as if he had come to the same conclusion I did. If I cast an ice spell while he was still frozen, he would do the same to me in kind. Our only chance to settle this was for us to wait until the spells expired, giving us the chance to dodge and react. There was a problem though. I had frozen him before he had frozen me, by a full two seconds by my estimates. In those two seconds, he would be able to dodge and freeze me again, and I would simply be at his mercy. Gripping my sword in my right hand, I knew I only had one chance. The 30 seconds ran out, and he leapt to the side, throwing his ice spell at me. I blocked with my sword. Regent smiled before he rushed forward, thinking that my sword counted as a target for his spell. As I dodged to the side, I threw my own ice spell at him before rolling into another corridor, out of his field of vision. He started to scream at me for having cheated, and I poked my right hand back into the room, displaying the rings on it. After telling him I had a ring of minor spell reflection, and how it allowed me to block spells as if they were weapons, he fell silent. Knowing I would just receive an ice spell if I tried to enter the room to finish him off, I sped down the corridor away from him. I was hoping to find Lith, who more than likely not would appreciate an ally who wasn't dressed like they were attending a funeral. As I ran where I hoped he was, I heard shouts coming from a room close by, and I knew I had to find my way inside. Selena was yelling at her ex-boyfriend, who seemed intent on trying to convert her back to his side. At first he was pleading with her, 
saying that he had only joined with Ulsic for his chances to talk with her, and that it was only a matter of time before House Cerberus was killed. If she wanted him to, he could ask Ulsic to spare her, and even allow her to join his house. Selina's rebuttal was surprisingly rude, and I doubt she would have said if she knew anyone else was listening. Her ex did not seem to approve either, and stopped pleading with her, saying that she wasn't playing her character and that her character would still be with him, since they were supposed to get married. Selina said that his old character was permanently dead, and that she had no ties with this new one. He exasperately told her that this new character was his old character's twin brother. <laughs> okay. All right. And that she would naturally be more interested in him. Instead of the person who had killed her fiancé, he shouted these last few words so loudly, I'm sure that everyone within the field had heard. Realising that I might never have a better cue ever again in my entire life, I stepped into the small room where the two of them were arguing. He stared at me as if he had just managed to succeed in summoning the devil. A look of awe and shock with a heavy amount of fear. All of this was quickly consumed by pure rage as he began to shout at me, telling me I was weak and that he had already killed me during this event. Selina stared at him as if there was no way he could repulse her anymore. He rushed towards me, his two-handed sword swinging wildly. It was pathetic. In the months since I had last seen him, he hadn't changed at all. He fell into easy patterns, his sword was slow and he had no sense for his surroundings. He was fighting like a child, an angry child. He thought that his tantrum gave him strength. I landed blow after blow, but it quickly became clear that he wasn't counting. I watched as he kept accidentally slamming his sword into walls rather than me, his rage only increasing further. I did nothing to help ease his anger. The mean side of me took over and I taunted him, striking him painfully on the fingers while he screamed at me to die. Selena faded into the background, blurred by the malice, and I only saw openings and weaknesses in my opponent's defence. With a hard strike to his hands, he dropped his sword, yelling in pain and rage. I smiled at him, a perfectly villainous smile, laughing at how pathetic he was. No sword in hand, he charged me, screaming and yelling, and I watched amused, wondering what he would do. He punched me in the face. <laughs> <laughs> I staggered back, surprised by not only the punch but the fact that it had managed to hit me. The pain suddenly woke me and I saw Selina again, looking scared as she stared at the two of us. The punch seemed to wake him from his trance as well and he stared at me in horror. We all stood, silent, not certain what to do next. I suddenly felt ashamed and I turned away from the two of them, reaching up at my face to try and see if I could feel any damage. He didn't miss the chance. He ran, picked up his sword and then rushed past me. Running off into the labyrinth, I let him go, wondering what Selina thought of what had just happened. Looking at me rather solemnly, she said that I had been hurting him. I didn't say anything, but slumped down against a wall, feeling that a break would be a good idea. After a moment, she asked if I was hurt. Without thinking, I said that I had taken 14 points of damage, and she looked surprised. A moment passed, and it became apparent that if I cared more about my fictional injuries than any others were negligible. As she healed me, I noticed something was wrong and I asked where Harjo was. He said he had gone after Ulsa. Swearing, I stood up, knowing that Harjo didn't stand a chance against the Lich. I almost set off running, before I realised that while Selina did have a few offensive spells now, she was still primarily a healer, and leaving her by herself was something only an idiot like Harjo would do. She understood my intent, and we set off, weaving through the corridors, listening for signs of the battle. It looked like the other people had also been listening for battle, and it overheard ours. At the end of the corridor stood Promaeus, Regent, and the fat woman warrior, the misplaced teenager, and the ex-boyfriend. The ex-boyfriend shouted at us with rage, then ordered the rest of them to hunt us down. The five of them started heading towards us, and we quickly turned around, racing away from them. Selena, amidst all her wonderful attributes, wasn't anywhere near as fast as I was. Thankfully, the group behind us also were slowed down, thanks to losing sight of us behind corridors and bends. Even so, they managed to stay on our trail fairly well, try as I might to shake them. Realising that this was the majority of Ulsic's force, calling for help meant that the odds were in our favour, that anyone who'd come would be an ally. Shouting for help, I led Selena by the hand through the corridors and rooms, hoping that the group behind us wouldn't catch up. I heard Lith. He was in a direction I wanted to avoid, thanks to a long, unbroken corridor, but I decided to take the chance. Passing into the corridor, I heard shouts from behind me, and I cursed, taking a guess at who was the first to reach us. 
The grey warrior was racing towards us, his intent clear. Then I heard shouts coming from in front of me. Hope rose in me as I saw Lith standing, his shield in front of him, with the five girls behind him, shouting for us to keep running. Regent didn't slow down, and Lith advanced forward. I shouted at him that he didn't stand a chance, but Lith ignored me, continuing forward. As I passed him, I realised something. He wasn't holding his sword. With both hands on his shield, he approached Regent, who stopped, looking intrigued at Lith's lack of a weapon. He swung his axe with a blinding speed at Lith. He brought up his shield with time to spare. The Grey Warrior launched another attack, but Lith's shield moved fast enough to block again his two arms moving it far faster than he could do it with only one. They were at a standstill, but the rest of Ulsuk's grip was coming down the corridor as well. I moved behind Lith, trying to get a strike in, but Lith's shield blocked me just as much as it blocked our opponents. Finally, our five enemies were all together, right in front of Lith, and I heard him shout a command at the five girls. Four of them began to throw spells. Most were weak, pathetic spells, and their aim hadn't improved at all. But within this corridor, our enemies had no room to dodge. The fifth girl, the shuffling one, who had chosen to be a warrior, was handing beanbags to each of her friends as quickly as she could, and the five of them were raining down a torrent of spells on our foes. They struggled trying to dodge at first, but it was like trying to dodge raindrops. Regent cast his eye spell at Lith, who shrugged, immune to it and not really interested in moving to begin with. I realise now that the old man's grandson had told Lith his technique of using both hands on his shield. Though it was useless when by himself, with an ally, Lith was practically invincible. Regent was now moving with speed that was truly awe-inspiring, managing to get a few hits in out of sheer determination. But Selena's healing kept Lith well away from any danger. I could see Ulsuk's group struggling to do the math as spell after spell hit them, and it wasn't long before the teenager dropped after getting hit by three spells at once probably just to save his brain from trying to do the calculations. Finally, but much too late, they realised just how quickly they were taking damage and that retreating was the best option. As they moved back, we moved forward. The fat warrior woman soon collapsed, the barrage of spells being too much for her, and she blocked a good portion of the corridor. Selina had joined, casting spells, and a well-aimed spell took down her ex-boyfriend, who slumped down next to the woman. Then, Primaeus charged. Regent quickly got out of his way, and he slammed his shield into Lith's, a blow that threw him backwards, catching Lith before he fell to the ground. I saw that this was something that could really hurt someone, so I called out to Primaeus, saying that what he did was much too dangerous. Primaeus ignored me, took his position, and charged forward once again. I watched as Lith braced himself, and I shouted at Primaeus to stop. He kept moving, focused on slamming his shield as hard as he could into us completely oblivious to the dark shape that had crawled forward from beside us. Turned to the side and curled up in a ball, I saw the shuffling girl place herself right into Primaeus' path. I shouted at her to get out of the way, but it was too late. Primaeus tripped spectacularly. There was a brief moment where everyone saw him become airborne, a look of horror on his face as he continued to head towards Lith. Thankfully, he managed to turn his head so that his face wasn't what collided with Lith's shield. But his head slammed into the wood all the same, and he crumbled to the ground. Before I could shout at the girl, before I could check to see if Primaeus was alright, I heard Lith exclaim that what just had happened was awesome. The tension disappeared immediately, and I saw Regent unable to conceal a smile. We all stopped, and I bent down, asking Primaeus if he was okay. He muttered that he took harder hits at the Recreation Society, and slowly got up, taking his position next to Regent, still looking disorientated. As we started up the game again, the two of them turned around to run, but I caught Regent with my ice spell, while Primaeus was hit by another barrage of spells from the girls. Regent, unable to dodge, fell shortly afterwards. I took a moment to catch my breath before moving forward, dealing killing blows to each of our enemies, with the five of them dead and Rubido having also been dealt with. That only left the black-scaled warrior and Ulsuk himself. Listening, I realised that the sound of the crowd outside were much louder than they had been before. With a sudden realisation, I told everyone to head outside, running as fast as I could. Lith struggled to keep up, but was left far behind along with the others as I headed for the exit of the castle. My hatred of Ulsic only increased, as the bastard hadn't even bothered to enter the castle, instead sending his minions at us. As I got closer and closer, I began to hear Harjol and Ulsic shouting, 
and I cursed at Harjo for being so goddamn stupid. Outside, I was relieved to see Harjo still standing. He was shouting out spells, casting them at Ulsic, and the black skilled warrior with a degree of skill that I had never seen before. Ulsic was hit by several spells, but seemed to not care at all, casting spells almost lazily at Harjo. The warrior was surprisingly keeping his distance from Harjo, and when it looked as if he was about to run forward, Ulsic would call him back. I ran up to Harjo. He was gasping for breath between spells. When he looked at me, he smiled, stumbling slightly as if he just realised how tired he was. With a tired, low voice, very unlike the way he had been shedding his spells, he told me he had managed to deal 10 ice damage and 10 fire damage to the sword, though it had cost him a good chunk of his own HP. I had wanted to yell at him, to call him an idiot for going out on his own, but instead I smiled, saying he'd done well. My arrival seemed to trigger something in Ulsic. No longer content to lazily cast spells, he started flinging them towards us, and the black scaled warrior rushed forward, apparently now free from Ulsic's tether. He came straight at me. I rushed towards him, both of us understanding the importance of this battle. We were both almost too eager to battle, intent on finally settling this. He was the last wall between me and Ulsic, and I was the one that he needed to kill above all else. Our swords clashed and I saw that he didn't manage to perform a clever parry. The force of my sword too much for him to throw it off. He struggled under the pressure for a moment before returning with an equal force. We each leapt back and I smiled, knowing that this would not be like our last two battles. In the first one, he had defeated me cleanly, not giving me a chance to even react. In the second, he had avoided me, attacking my friends instead. This time, however, I was not allowing him to go anywhere near Harjo. He tried to run past me, but I attacked him again and again, forcing him to block. As I tried to strike against his shoulder, I sensed his parry, but continued to strike anyway. He blocked, and with a wicked twist of his sword swung it down upon me. Raising my left hand, I blocked the strike with it, then struck him hard in the side for 8 points of damage. I smiled, then tried striking at him again, but he lifted his own left hand, blocking my sword. He didn't need to tell me that he also had bracers. We simply kept fighting and I pushed him further and further away from Harjo and Ulsa. Realising my mistake far too late, I turned and rushed back towards Harjo, ignoring my opponent. How could I have done something so stupid? How could he have left Harjo alone to fight Ulsa? It happened when I was only a few feet away from him. Harjo and Ulsa had each exchanged spells, but Harjo's had not been an instant kill spell. Ulsa had merely uttered the word death, and as the beanbag struck Harjo, I shouted with rage then hopelessness, then sorrow. I had been relying on Harjo to destroy the phylactery, but that was pushed out of my mind as I watched Harjo collapse. Unlike me, who could die, but be resurrected several times because I was low level. Harjo had long passed that point. His death was permanent. I didn't think I would cry. It was stupid of me too, but Harjo's expressionless face was frozen as he lay on the ground, looking as dead as his character was. Blinking back tears, memories of the battles we had fought together flooded towards me. Nothing. We had struggled for nothing. How Cerberus had lost its most important member. All because we had wanted to teach Ulsic a lesson. All because I had rushed away from him to fight. I heard Lith also begin to scream, and I saw him running. He disappeared from my field of vision, which had narrowed intensely. With Hargel dead, Ulsic's death would be meaningless, but he would suffer it all the same. Ulsic was laughing, laughing in a way that hurt me. I struggled to keep focus, my mind whirling, and I knew I had to settle on a single thought to keep my insanity. Ignoring my hatred or my sorrow, I settled on the single thought that Ulsic needed to die. I ran at him, but the black skilled warrior had moved between us, protecting his master. I struck hard and fast, my fury seeping into my attacks, but this made them easy to predict and easy to dodge. Struggling to keep myself from being reckless, I watched as he pushed me backward, away from Ulsic, who was content to watch my struggle, still laughing. As I fought, I noticed that while I was being forced to dodge backwards, the attacks were not coming as quickly as they had been before. With a sudden realisation, I saw that he was fighting more defensively, and as I swung my sword, I forced him to forego an attack and block with his arm, seeing no reason for him not to be fighting all out. I wondered if he was doing it subconsciously, a sign of how wounded he was. Intent to use Hargel's legacy of damage, I pulled a beanbag out of my pocket. Ulsic responded with a smile, and I saw that the warrior didn't seem at all threatened. Ulsic must have cast a ward on him to protect him from my ice spell, 
but that showed just how little he understood about me. Given the choice between the two, I preferred fire. I said the spell and threw it before he realised what had hit him. As he took the 7 fire damage from my most powerful spell, the one I could only cast once a day, he dropped to his knees. His sword, the phylactery, dropped to the ground, its protector finally defeated. Ulsic was furious. <laughs> he began to cast spells after spell, forcing me backwards away from the sword, bellowing at everyone and everything. Even though he was the only one left, this would be the greatest challenge yet, as he was by far the most powerful collection of stats ever assembled in one person that ever existed in this LARP. Shouts came from behind me, and I turned to see Lith and the girls rushing towards me. I was about to rebuke Lith, and asked him why he had left me to fight against the warrior by myself. But I was only too glad to see him, even more than him. I was glad to see our four mage girls, who I could only hope had a lightning spell they could use to destroy the phylacter. With all of how Cerberus assembled before him, Ulsic should have been afraid, but his smile, his disgusting smile, suddenly brought his character sheet back into my memory. I started to shout at everyone to get back, and that I was the only one who could fight him, but it was too late. With an exaggerated flourish, he dropped a beanbag to the ground, announcing that he had just cast Firestorm, dealing 10 fire damage to everyone in a 50 foot radius. The first spell I had ever seen him cast swept past me, my ruby ring protecting me from the damage. No one else was as lucky. Two of the girls, only first level mages, dropped from that single spell. As I shouted for the rest to run back, Ulsa cast Firestorm again, dropping all the teenage girls. Selena looked torn and moved towards the girls, in order to try and heal them so that they wouldn't die. I shouted again, shouted desperately for her to run, but Ulsic's third firestorm was cast just as she managed to get one of the girls to stand, who fell over again. Tears in her eyes, she turned to run, but Ulsic's fourth firestorm ripped into her, forcing her to her knees. Lith, the horror of what had just happened gripping him, he was breathing hard. He could barely have any HP left and I screamed, screamed as hard as I could for him to stop being an idiot and to get the hell away. He smiled and charged forward. Ulsic seemed amused, holding his beanbag over him. He seemed to be waiting until Lith was only a few feet away before he finished him. I kept screaming at Lith, though I knew it was too late for him to turn back. He ran at Ulsic as fast as he could, his shield flung away with his sword held high. I almost couldn't watch, but I knew I had to, out of my duty to him as a friend. Then, before he reached Ulsic, he rolled to the side, striking twice at the sword that lay a few feet in front of him, calling out five lightning damage each time. What? Lith has lightning damage? Ulsic looked confused, but I noticed it. On Lith's finger was the unique ring I had entrusted to Hargel, and I turned to look at her fallen friend, who was smiling despite his death. Lith pointed to his ring, telling him what it did, and Ulsic's slow brain finally managed to understand what it all meant. With a look of absolute fury, he threw down the beanbag, casting his fifth firestorm, and I watched as Lith fell to the ground. Looking around, I saw the remnants of how Cerberus were just a one lone fighter in a matter of minutes. A cold wind swept over the field, and I turned back to look at my enemy, who smiled at the destruction he had caused. Ulsic stared at me. Looking down at my finger, he saw the black and ruby ring and knew why I was still standing. He sneered as if he was about to say something, but he said nothing, knowing I would hear none of it. Right now I knew that I was the only one who had a chance to defeat him, perhaps who ever had a chance to defeat him, and it would take everything I had in order to do so. He threw an instant kill spell at me, and I dodged to the side. He threw another, and I dodged again. Moving closer towards him, he raised a bing bag as if to throw it at his feet, but hesitated. He realised what I had figured out, that all of his area spells dealt fire damage. He tried another kill spell, but I blocked it this time with my sword. He looked triumphant for the briefest of seconds before remembering another ring I possessed. Another instant death spell was blocked by my sword, and now he was within my range. I hit him, again and again as he ran backwards, thinking of what he could do while I blocked another kill spell aimed at me. Victory started to look not only possible to me, but inevitable. He had nothing he could do against me, and his HP dwindled with each strike. Then, as if by fate, decided to mock me, teaching me that I had learned nothing in these last several months. I blocked a spell instinctively, not realising what word he had said before he had cast it. Shatter. Oh, oh, what a fucking oh, dick! Oh, me! 
Me. Honestly, just fuck jump him me. at this point oh, and start beating the fuck out of him. <laughs> just fucking bang oh. him. Oh, Jesus. Fuck. Phone is mad to come and pick him up. <laughs> <laughs> he crowned triumphantly. Watching as I discarded the destroyed weapon, savouring the moment as much as he could, as my brain raced as what to do, Ulsic stepped towards me, a kill spell in his hand. He threw it at me, a savage look in his eye, as he was about to finally do what he had desired for months. I caught the spell, holding it in my hand. I turned it so that he could clearly see my ring, the one that allowed me to block spells as if they were weapon. Before saying bracers, the ability to block weapons with my hands, his triumphant look deflated slightly, but he still thought he had the upper hand. As he threw spell after spell at me, I taught him otherwise. Blocking spells with my hands was easier than blocking them with my sword, and I snatched the beanbags out of the air, dropping them to the ground. Even so, he continued to try, thinking that I had no way of returning an attack. He followed me, trying to keep close, but I kept my distance, leading him around the field until I arrived at the place I wanted to be. Picking up the phylactery from between the bodies of the black-scaled warrior and Lith, I turned to face Ulsic. He immediately threw a shatter spell at me, forgetting what he knew perfectly well. I blocked it with a sword, and Ulsic's eyes widened. Knowing that this was a weapon that could only be destroyed in a very, very specific way, it was his stupidity, which must be infinite, that made him decide to make his phylactery the one and only weapon type that I could use. I started to cut away at him with the sword, and he started to scream at me. I ignored him, continuing to deliver blow after blow into his fat body, and he changed tactics, trying to plead for me to stop, with a lick of pure disgust, I silenced his pathetic whimpers. Finally, he said that I couldn't kill him with the sword, because as long as the phylactery remained, he would return, in full strength. I knew full well, that he only said this because he thought I didn't know what the sword needed to consume a soul in order to revive him, that he was trying to lie his way out of death. Pulling back the blade, I asked him how much HP he had left. He smiled, saying that he had only five meaning a single strike would kill him. It was a hard strike. It wasn't just me. It was everyone. Everyone who wanted this man punished. Everyone who had been forced to carry him on their shoulders. Everyone who had refused to. There was no wrath in the blow. Just pure and simple justice, which I knew would hurt him far more. I stabbed at his belly, thrusting him backwards, where he fell over in a heap. He started to protest, to vent in rage, but I had no time for him. No time to savour the victory I had wanted for so long. My healing spells, the weakest of their kind, could only restore fallen players within five minutes of them falling, and I had no idea how long it had been fighting against Ulsic. Rushing over to Lith, I placed a hand on his shoulder, and was relieved to see my healing spell bring him back. Not even waiting for him to stand, I ran towards where Selina lay upon the ground, healing her as quickly as I could. Dramatically, she once again pretended to wake up slowly as she had upon the table in the Sheshna cave, and feigned surprise as she sat up and looked at me. A part of me wished to act out a reunion, but I was too busy running towards Hargel. I stopped. My last remaining healing spell couldn't save him. No healing could. He was dead beyond dead. The character he had played since the very beginning of this LARP. Bitterly, I knew that killing Ulsic had not been worth it. Grasping at the sword, the phylactery we had worked so hard to destroy, I continued walking over towards Hargel. He had died valiantly, and he deserved all the respect we could give him. I sensed someone behind me, and turned to look. Selena had wasted no time, and I saw the five girls standing, cheering and shouting to each other. Lith walked past them, not sharing their mirth, and stopped next to us, staring down at Hargel. He was lying with his eyes closed, holding out the sword in front of me, over Hargel's body. I said, for Hargel before channeling my final heal spell into the sword, healing it for four points of damage. Selina, knowing what else needed to be done, stretched out a hand to touch the sword and said, for Hargel, before healing it for the remaining six damage. Lith, perhaps feeling somewhat left out, also stretched out his hand to touch the sword and said, for Hargel, before simply staring down at our fallen friend. People started cheering, or perhaps they had been cheering for a while. I watched as the spectators rushed towards us, their voices a singular blend of myriad and praise. Somehow it all seemed distant, unreal. The monster leader was saying things that didn't matter. Vlain and Rand were talking about the meaningless battle, and everyone was ignoring how Hargel had sacrificed himself in order to make sure that Ulsic would remain dead forever. 
Ulsic was not taking his defeat calmly. He started to shout and scream about cheating and conspiracies, launching the monster leader into an argument defending our victory. They shouted at each other, finally revealing all the hostility they had for each other. Only for a brief moment. I turned to see why they had stopped, and saw the last plotmaster, the one who even now reminded me of a gnome. He said he had watched the entire battle from the second level of the castle, looking upon the plywood maze. He said that all six forces had been defeated fairly, and he didn't need to say anything about the battle that took place in the field, as it was clear that Ulsic had been defeated without anyone able to say otherwise. Looking at the monster leader, he said that he was surprised that in all of this fighting that he had assured had not been just to kill Ulsic. No one had made mention that they had been fighting for a prize. The monster leader looked ashamed for the briefest moments, but the gnomish plotmaster continued, saying that he had planned the prize to be something that Ulsic would have really wanted. But it was now a question of whether the victors would also like to receive it. They would find it in the ruins of the castle, he reasoned. Pulling out a piece of paper, he walked forward. People moved to get out of his way, until he stood in front of me. He simply said that I deserved it. An almost mischievous look in his eyes, before turning around as I read the title of the piece of paper. Scroll of True Resurrection. Hey! Hey! <laughs> For <Hard> Harjo! <laughs> There was only a little bit of time left of the event, and everyone seemed more than content to simply discuss what had taken place, swapping stories and exaggerated accounts. Harjo wasn't helping much, telling everyone that would listen about how he had journeyed through hell itself in order to return from being permanently dead, and had to literally fight through an army of monsters. I was just glad that I wouldn't have to hear him whine about losing his character, which he certainly would have done for several months, and let him say whatever he wanted. As the best known leader of House Cerberus, who had fought against the town itself in order to save them from an evil lich, he was constantly surrounded. In the little time left of the event, House Cerberus had grown to include minor noble houses within it, and a full third of the members of the LARP. Lith's popularity also had dramatically increased, and he was constantly surrounded by the four teenage girls who had served as his artillery. He seemed to enjoy the attention as well as their company responding quite earnestly to their questions about death and other silly things teenage girls obsess about. The fifth member of the goth girl seemed interested in applying for a job as my shadow, the sound of her shuffling constantly behind me. Finally, I asked her the question that I had been waiting to ask her for ages. She blushed and answered the reason she shuffled her feet was because tiny little steps were cuter than big ones. Fucking <coughs> cringe! <coughs> 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 As the event came to a close, everyone gathered inside the inn, where the monster leader started the closing ceremony. The gnomish plotmaster was smiling, and no one seemed at all displeased by the lack of Ulsa. As the events of the weekend were recounted, there was a moment where the monster leader paused, as if he was going to say something more than just a brief summary, but he chose not to. The ceremony finished, and the event finally over, we all prepared to leave the LARP. The girl he thought shuffling around was cute followed me as I said my goodbyes. Vlain eyed me suspiciously, making a few jokes I'm sure he thought were good natured. He was already planning his next constant NPC, though he admitted that he might just end up making another old wizard. He then told me when his next game was planned, and I said I'd make sure to be there. Rend and the monster leader were at the cave, getting things organised. A lot of things needed to be done before the next event, including promoting a new plot master. As Ulsic had been quietly banned from the entire LARP, shortly after his death. He had protested, but threats of legal action quickly shut him up. Ulsic was gone. His fat little girlfriend ran around searching for him, calling out for him, but it looks like he had left early. The monster leader said she had threatened to quit if Ulsic left, but the general opinion had been good riddance. I made sure to thank the old man and his grandson, since they had really helped us out. The old man said that he was really glad to have come, and he said he had a great time with his grandson. Ulsic's squad of seven ended up approaching me, though I think I would have preferred not meeting them. They said I should join their medieval combat recreation society, but I just replied that I'd think about it. They asked if I had seen Ulsic, since he owed them a fair amount of money. I told them I didn't plan on ever seeing him again. With the girl still shuffling behind me, I walked over to your friends, thanking them for being excellent members of House Cerberus. They said that they might try adventuring more next time they came, because they had started to realise how fun battles could be. As I walked away, I realised that she was still following me, and I think we both realised who was the last person I had to say goodbye to. I tried to shake her off, but she seemed intent on staying with me. When it looked like I had no other option, 
I turned round to face her. She looked as if she was holding back tears. As I told her that it had been fun LARPing with her, she bit her bottom lip, as if to stop herself from saying something that was supposed to burst out of her. We stood silent, neither of us knowing what to say, until she said, I hadn't said goodbye to Selena yet, looking directly at her. I said that was true. After taking a deep breath, she smiled. She then told me I should go before Selena left. I nodded, and I started to walk away. Before I had taken a few steps, she called out to me. Turning around, I saw her hesitate, as if making a hard decision, before she simply asked for my email address. Smiling, I gave it to her, and received hers in exchange. We stood only a few feet apart, before she stepped towards and hugged me. Gently patting her back, I told her that I'd definitely send her a message soon. I said goodbye to her, and went off looking for Selena. She was standing outside the inn by herself. I realised that I was nervous, but I hid it well and Selena greeted me with a smile. We began to talk about the event and everything that had taken place, but neither of us seemed to be really paying attention to the conversation. As our own words drifted around us, neither of us absorbing them in, we stared at each other. There was an odd tension building between us, and I knew I couldn't delay it any longer. She beat me to it. Looking down at the ground, she said that it would be dinner time soon. Stupidly, I simply agreed. Looking up, she smiled and asked if I wanted to have dinner with her. Before I could answer, she leaned in close to me, closed her eyes, and kissed me. It was a soft, gentle kiss. She smiled back, blushing deeply, waiting for my response. When my mind finally started working again, I said the first thing that came to it. I told her that I was heading home with Lith and Hargel, and that I'd probably be eating dinner with them. What? what? Wait, what? What a dick. <laughs> I'd be like, if that happened to me, I'd be like, <laughs> all right, nerd. <laughs> <laughs> That's pure autism. Yeah. Like that. She looked at me as if I had just said that I hated her. She took the slightest step back, as if preparing to run away, and my stupid brain nearly killed itself trying to figure out what to do next. Not knowing what else to do, I stepped forward and held her, pulling her close as I kissed her. As I said goodbye to her, I said that I'd send her an email later tonight, to see when she was free so that we could have dinner together. She merely waved, looking somewhat dazed, as I headed off to find Hargel and Lyft. They had nearly finished packing up the car, and I saw all the gear I had bought and barely used. Glad that Hargel had never been tempted to use his ninja costume. We all got into the car. Amazed that the weekend had gone so well, we traded stories and perspectives during the car ride, and we competed to see who gave the most exaggerated account of her final moments fighting also. Hargel won easily, explaining that he had been guiding us in spirit, telling us what to do. Lith laughed, saying that Hargel had almost yelled at him when he had started to pull off the lightning ring thinking that he had just been trying to loot him. I laughed at this too, partially because I wouldn't be surprised if Hargel would be the first one to loot one of his friends when they died. Hargel only grinned, before saying that it looked like things would definitely be changing at the LARP. With him being the head of the largest noble house, he hinted that he might actually have a chance of becoming the next plotmaster, fearing what would happen to the LARP if Hargel was allowed any measure of control. I said he'd better off putting in a good word for Vlain or Rand. Looking back at the event, I had the feeling that most of it sounded more impressive than it had been. In truth, it had just been running around the woods, fighting imaginary monsters and people. Yet, I had also not only helped save my friends, I had defeated the man I hated the most in a way he'd never forget. Though I still hated Ulsic, perhaps more than a person should, I no longer had to worry about him or his schemes, nor would anyone else at the LARP. Feeling peaceful, I listened as my friends started to talk about their plans for the future of House Cerberus, excited about all the possibilities they now had. Maybe, just maybe, they asked me to help them out. I'll join them the next time they go. The end. So what do you think? I really, really enjoyed it. I couldn't stop reading the story. I absolutely loved it. I really enjoyed it as well myself, to be honest with you. Honestly, tell me the next story isn't going to be all sick, run about the woods like friggin' Jason Voorhees, Jason Voorhees <laughs> watching them from the darkness. I know. But look, we're not going to do that one just yet. We're going to go back and redo the first part I'm going to do it all in one go. Yeah, I, it was only an hour and a half the first time we did it, so it might take us a wee bit, but we're going to get that out very, like early January, so don't yeah. worry about that. We're going to be having a wee bit of time off. A wee bit over, of time off over Christmas, but we'll be back. Before the new year, anyway. Yeah, more than likely, I would say so. Have a very Merry Christmas, or whatever holidays you celebrate. All that jazz. Um, also, again, remember to subscribe, all that other good stuff. And, you know, I hope you guys enjoyed. I really enjoyed this one myself. And share it with your friends, you know, because I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah. Like, Garb's kind of gay, but, like, you know, this was cool. Yeah.
It was a good call. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.